and thank you for the invitation today to speak. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you again. I'm gonna talk about papillodium and idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I'm gonna to try to move fairly quickly in the interest of time. Um, in talking about papillodema and idiopathic intracranial hypertension, first we need to, I have no financial disclosure, disclosures. Um, first we need to define what is papillodema. So by looking at fundus photographs, sometimes it's very difficult to determine if optic discs are swollen due to papillodema, especially if you have a scenario like this where you have only one eye, no clinical history, you know nothing about the patient. Artificial intelligence programs have become very good at identifying papilledema from non-papilledema, but as a clinician, without any other information, I would be hard pressed to determine whether these optic discs were from papilledema or from some other cause of optic disc edema. In fact, none of these are from papilledema. They're all swollen optic nerves um, from various causes. We have ischemia, compression, and infectious and non-infectious inflammatory optic neuropathies. So papilledema, just as um, to define the term, is optic disc edema due solely to elevated intracranial pressure. Now that we have a working definition for papilledema, does papilledema equal idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Well, the obvious answer is no. There are multiple causes that are multiple things that can cause papilledema, such as infections, inflammatory conditions, compressive conditions, and there are a number of etiologies for each of these causes. I've listed some here just for um, reference purposes, such as meningeal inflammation from a bacterial meningitis, idiopathic or inflammatory um, meningeal inflammation, um, intracranial space occupying lesions are the ones that we're probably more concerned about than most other things, um, meningiomas invading the venous sinus system. All of these can cause elevated intracranial pressure and papilledema. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension, however, is slightly different because unfortunately, um, we don't know what the underlying cause for idiopathic intracranial hypertension is. So I don't know if I can accurately define what is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but we can kind of describe what it is. And it's a syndrome of elevated intracranial pressure of unknown etiology. It's usually seen in women in their childbearing ages and it's associated with changes in weight, either with being overweight or with a recent weight gain. The incidence reported for idiopathic intracranial hypertension in the general population is low. It's one in 100,000, but it increases three to fourfold in an appropriate demographic, usually in the overweight population. Unfortunately, due to the obesity epidemic um, that's currently ongoing, um, we can see here a trend in obesity in the United States and adults, and it's predicted that by 2030, 50% of the adult U.S. population will be overweight. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension, the incidence of it, is mirroring this obesity trend. So we expect to see a lot more cases of idiopathic intracranial hypertension um, in the near future. So just to talk a little bit about idiopathic intracranial hypertension, uh, the symptoms of this disorder are headaches. You can also get transient visual obscurations, which is depicted by the cartoon on the right, which is really graying or blacking out of the vision as someone changes head position, usually to a more dependent position, as if they're bending over. You also get pulsatile tinnitus or pulse synchronal, synchronous tinnitus. So um, in case people are unaware of what that sounds like to a patient, I have this short audio, audio clip here, which will um, so to kind of give you an idea of what patients are experiencing when they complain of pulsatile tinnitus or pulse synchronous tinnitus, and also double vision. And we're going to come back a little bit to double vision in a second. All of these symptoms are concerning to the patients, but they don't cause any serious or pose any serious medical concerns in that they don't cause any permanent physical dysfunction. However, 
once we get into the signs of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, particularly papilledema, which you can see here from one of my patients who had very severe papilledema in this 35-year-old woman who was morbidly obese, papilledema can lead to severe and permanent vision loss. Some of the other signs of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, as I mentioned, are cranial nerve palsy, with a sixth nerve palsy being the most common. There have been reports in the literature of other cranial nerve palsy, such as cranial nerve four, five, uh, seven, dysfunction related to elevated intracranial pressure, but by far um, the most common is a sixth nerve palsy. As Dr. Kadar mentioned, there are also visual field changes men, um, that can be seen in idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but usually the visual function is fairly well preserved with normal visual acuity, normal color vision, and essentially normal visual fields. However, the visual field defects that are commonly seen in idiopathic intracranial hypertension or with papilledema are an enlarged blind spot or a nasal depression. Um, the nasal depression is the one of the more common visual field defects. With progressive and continued swelling of the optic nerves, though, you can eventually get severe constriction of the visual fields where people are only seeing out of really the central vision in each eye. In these cases, the visual acuity can still be relatively normal. And then another sign of elevated intracranial pressure, not specific to idiopathic intracranial hypertension, are radiographic changes. And this is from a paper that we published at Emory um, in 2021, just depicting some of the signs seen radiographically associated with elevated intracranial pressure. We can see a partially empty or empty cella, cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, enlargement of Meckel's cave where cranial nerve five traverses through, meningoencephaloceles and basal encephaloceles. These are, um, um, can be somewhat associated with an increased incidence of seizures. And actually we're looking into that association now as one of our current research projects. Vertical tortuosity of the optic nerve is also seen with chronically elevated intracranial pressure as well as posterior flattening of the globe. You can see protrusion of the optic nerve head into the globe in these axial slices, as well as perioptic CSF space. Um, enhancement of the optic nerves in idiopathic intracranial hypertension is extreme, would um, basically disclude the diagnosis with the exception of right at the optic nerve head, just from the uh, stasis of CSF there. <clears throat> and you can see venous sinus stenosis bilaterally, which you can determine by this nice little slow taper of the venous sinuses. <clears throat> the diagnostic criteria were revised in 2013, um, but essentially to make the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension requires uh, the presence of papilledema, elevated pressure on a lumbar puncture in the left in the lateral decubitus position, and normal CSF studies, and no alternate cause. I've shown here in this figure um, the diagnostic criteria, the revised diagnostic criteria by Friedman, Liu, and Degree um, that was proposed in 2013. So in the top portion panel, this is what's required for a diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri, and it includes papilledema and the other conditions that we mentioned. They do talk about a diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri without papilledema. Um, this is a diagnosis, however, without papilledema, we usually don't see these patients because they're not at risk for vision loss without swelling of their optic nerves from their elevated intracranial pressure. The workup really needs to rule out other causes of elevated intracranial pressure. So you would need an MRI brain, possibly an MRI orbits as well, both with and without contrast, an MRV of the head to rule out venous sinus thrombosis or any compressive lesion on the venous sinus system. And then as I mentioned, the lumbar puncture with CSF studies, Traditionally, it's been reported that an elevated opening pressure is above 25 centimeters of water. However, recent studies have suggested that that is within, well within the range of what is typically seen in normal people and that the diagnostic criteria should consider um, raising that bar to 30 centimeters of water. And then normal CSF studies, including cell count, glucose, protein, 
cytology. I always get a cryptococcal antigen as well. Um, flow cytometry, just to rule out any potential um, cancerous causes along with the cytology and CSF cultures. In atypical cases, you can consider getting an MRA of the head. Um, this would be really looking for a posteriorly draining carotid cavernous fistula. And also an MRI of the spine, uh, most relevant would be the lumbar spine. And that's depicted here sort of in this cartoon of a balloon as the fecal sac in the lumbar region can expand to alleviate some of the intracranial pressure, some of the pressure as a pressure head. If there is something that's constricting this lumbar region and not allowing the fecal sac to expand, there's a resultant forward or upward push of uh, pressure causing elevated intracranial pressure in those cases. And that would require a potentially different treatment than what we standardly do for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The treatment, the gold standard treatment for idiopathic intracranial hypertension is really conservative with weight loss. And we usually recommend about a 10% weight loss, 10% of their current body weight for weight loss. Um, as an adjunct to that, we do use medications such as acetazolamide and topiramate. And we go up to doses as high as potentially four grams a day for acetazolamide if necessary. Usually we start with about 500 milligrams twice a day. Uh, topiramate is also effective at lowering intracranial pressure as well as it's a treatment for migraine, so it may help a bit with the headaches. And as an added benefit, it also acts as an appetite suppressant, so it facilitates weight loss. In patients who are recalcitrant to medications and weight loss or who are having progressive visual dysfunction or who can't tolerate medications, Surgical treatments are an option. Um, they're listed here, optic nerve sheath fenestration, CSF diverting procedures such as a shunt, venous sinus stenting, and bariatric surgery. Just to say a little bit more about the last two, um, <clears throat> this is a stu 2022 study by Mullen et al. from Birmingham. And what they showed was um, in these figures, how changes in body weight affect changes in intracranial pressure. Now, if you look down at panel C, what they have is intracranial pressure as a percentage of body weight loss. And you can see a pretty decent effect as you get into the 10% range with, uh, in their study, it took about 20 to 30% of body weight loss from starting point to reach an intracranial pressure that was considered um, within the normal range. Um, in addition, they also looked at various types of um, methods of losing weight and CWI, the top, the blue line just stands for community weight intervention, such as Weight Watchers or some other community-based diet. And then they had surgical procedures and what they found were that surgical procedures um, particularly gastric bypass were most efficacious in facilitating weight loss. Moving on for a second to talk about venous sinus stenting. Now, personally, I don't have much experience with venous sinus stenting since we don't perform this very often at Emory. Um, but in cases where neurosurgery has considered doing venous sinus stenting, they look at the transstent gradient. And at Emory, they use a cutoff of um, eight millimeters of mercury. This study, which was recently published in 2022 in November, um, actually looked at various transstent gradient or um, transtenotic gradients. And what they found was that intervention in even a low transtenotic gradient of less than four millimeters of mercury produced a fairly robust decrease in retinal nerve fiber layer, improvement in visual fields, and decrease in um, papilledema and intracranial pressure, suggesting that venous sinus stenosis could be a viable option for treating idiopathic intracranial hypertension. However, there is a 2% risk of um, serious complications such as migration of the stent or potentially erosion of the stent through the venous sinuses. So we do need to be cautious about the potential complications for surgical treatments that we recommend. With that, I'll end the talk and I'm more than happy to answer any questions.